computer. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shelley Candle, and I'm the director of B City Canada. Uh, it's a great pleasure today to have with us Dr. Philip Gregory, um, Professor uh, Emeritus from the University of British Columbia. Um, his research uh, for his career has been in astronomy and astrophysics, and his research topics include quasars, microquasars, and extrasolar solar planets. But here he is talking about the magic of soil. Welcome, Dr. Gregory. Greetings. Hi. Thanks very much. So uh, it's really my great pleasure to be part of this uh, B City Canada webinar. Um, I've just become recently aware of your organization, and I celebrate what you're doing. Um, so I believe that my message today on the magic of soil is completely in line with, uh, you know, your philosophy. And uh, so that's really what I want to talk about. And um, to start with, let me introduce you to my wife, uh, Jackie, who is currently in our garden. I can't say we have any bees out at this time of the year, but uh, our garden is typically, you know, thronged with bees. Um, we're not short of them at all. And uh, we live on Bowen Island, uh, which is near to Vancouver uh, in British Columbia. So we're right on the ocean and uh, very near to Vancouver, but we're islanders. So I like to think of myself as an astrophysicist who's gone, went astray about four years ago and wandered off into agriculture and soil biology uh, to see if there was any solutions to the uh, serious problems that humanity faces. And uh, that's really the journey that I want to share with you today. So what triggered me uh, was basically an announcement that occurred um, back in December of, uh, I think it was December 5th, 2014. It was announced by the UN uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, and the announcement reads, only 60 years of farming left if soil degradation continues. This just blew my mind. I, I was well aware of where we were headed with um, climate change, but I didn't know that we degraded. Uh, they were basically counting down from 60 years. Then, in uh, no sooner had I decided that I needed to focus in on that, uh, this became my, my new passion. Um, then, uh, in October 2017, there was another announcement, this time from the UK Environmental Secretary Michael Gove. He warned that the UK is 30 to 40 years away from the eradication of soil fertility. So what are the causes of uh, soil degradation? They include plowing or tilling, chemical intensive farming, current livestock management and deforestation, as well as industrial and urban use. So you can see that the first three or four items are all connected with agriculture. And uh, so that's what uh, drove me to uh, investigate what was happening in conventional agriculture. Here's another way of looking at it. For every ton of food produced, we lose seven tons of topsoil. This is clearly unsustainable. So uh, this started me on a four-year journey into current agricultural practices, soil biology, climate change, and human health. I learned about some amazing advances that have been made in the last 20 to 30 years, and especially in the arena of soil biology and understanding nature's complexity. And along the way, I benefited from four courses that I completed from one of the pioneers of this new revolution, Dr. Elaine Ingham. So my talk is really a good news story. Um, and the good news is if we change the way we do agriculture, in response to the recent revolution in soil biology, we can one, rapidly reverse soil degradation, two, 
avoid the looming collapse of agriculture, three, reduce the chronic disease epidemics, and four, go a long way to solving global warming. So that's my task in the rest of the talk to persuade you that um, uh, there's basis for these arguments. These are all connected and the solution may not be that expensive as nature can do a lot of the work. The real challenge is to re-educate ourselves in the limited time frame available. So let me start now with a short video to sort of set the stage, which was made by Dr. Laura Danley, who was helping the US Department of Agriculture promote its Healthy Soils campaign. So this should work if I click on this link here. As an astronomer, I've spent most of my life looking deep into the universe. And every time I cast my eyes toward the heavens, I look with a sense of awe and wonder. I want to know more. I seek to understand and unlock the mysteries of the stars. For me, it's been a journey of learning and love. But most of all, it's been a journey of appreciation. Because the more I learn about our amazing universe, the more I realize what a special home we have within that universe, right here on planet Earth. It's a planet full of life and wonder, but most importantly, it's the only home we'll ever have. However, those of us living on this remarkable planet... So, Dr. Gregory, we're not seeing the, the image at all. Oh, you're not? No, we're hearing it, but we're not seeing it. Oh, oh I see. Um... Well, let me just put that on. So you're hearing it, but not seeing it. Hmm. That's correct. I thought you were seeing everything that my screen was showing. Uh, well, let, me, let me just go back to, um, no, I have to go to this one. I'll. Um, you click on the YouTube, perhaps, that link? Let, let me, I'll try that. Um, is that showing? Mm, no, what are, what are, no, we're just, see, oh, well, now something's changing. It's kind of still a blank screen. I don't know if it's just me. Okay, uh, just hang on a second. It's, uh, it's taking time to bring up that As video. As an astronomer, I've spent most of my life. Is that showing? No, I hear her. I don't, I don't see, I don't see. I, don't. I see, okay, I uh, let's, do I have to see share again? Um, the of the stars. Let me. Uh, I seem to have lost the um, the share ability. Oh. Hmm. Um, it says we're viewing your screen. That's what it uh, describes to me. Hmm. However, those of us living on this remarkable planet are facing some very serious challenges. Oh, that's too bad. By the year 2050, yeah. the global population will likely reach So we are not able to do that. Okay. Yeah, so I wish I could help you. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, let's see, why, why is it doing that? Okay, well, we're... <laughs> So here we are back to my screen. And are you seeing that? Yeah, we're seeing an astronomer's perspective. Right. Um, oh, what a shame. Yeah, um, that I have actually um, with, your, uh, with the presentation actually has that video clip. I, I had watched that. So if people mm -hmm. are interested, they'd be able to see it. I, I'm gonna send everyone that, uh, that link that you had sent, so people will be able to watch that. All right, okay, good. So um, let me move on then. Um, it, uh, it ends really by um, mentioning that the secret to healthy soil is the microbes. And um, so, uh, this is my next slide on the microbes, how they're the secret behind healthy soil. Each teaspoon of healthy soil contains as many microbes as the population of humans on Earth. And during the last uh, 30 years, science has begun to uh, uncover this, uh, this hidden universe. 
And we uh, like to think of it as a symphony of nature. And the symphony of nature is often referred to as the soil food web. And here are some of the microscopic and visible actors in the soil food web. So understanding their roles is key to appreciating the new revolution in soil biology. So at the base of this predator-prey relationship are bacteria and fungi. And so we'll focus on them, and then after that, we'll look at the important role that their predators play. So what do the bacteria and fungi do? Well, apart from uh, recycling dead plant and animal matter, they are also able to secrete enzymes and organic acids, which uh, can basically extract from the rock, sand, silt, and clay that the soil is made of, uh, all the other nutrients that the plants require, and including uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere. So uh, it turns out that um, as recently as 20 years ago, we realized that the world's largest mining operation is run by these soil fungi. Uh, and in this picture here, you can actually see, this is a, a picture of a rock, polished rock surface, which is being looked at under a microscope. And you can see those brown tunnels. Those are the tunnels produced by the uh, microscopic fungal hyphae. And they basically, go in and dissolve the rock and extract all the elements the rock is made of and then bring it back and store it in their fungal hyphae. So this is something that's, uh, you know, really quite new. So, uh, of course, when we kill off the soil microbes with current agricultural practices by using herbicides and fungicides, uh, we shut down nature's mining operation and turn living soil into dirt. So let's now look at the important role of the microscopic predators. So the bacteria and fungi store these nutrients that they've mined in high concentration in their bodies because they need them for life. Their predators don't need such high concentrations of the nutrients and poop them out uh, poop out the excess in a plant available form. And it turns out we need a hierarchy of predators to preserve the stable balance of predators and prey. So in nature, high biodiversity translates to population stability. So it turns out that the bacteria and fungi are concentrated right next to the plant root because the plants attract and feed them. And so if the microbes, uh, the bacteria and fungi are right next to the plant root, then of course that's where the, the uh, microscopic predators go and that's where they're pooping out all, all the excess nutrients. So this symphony of nature, uh, I like to think of the, the, the uh, plant as the conductor. And how does it do this? So, uh, we're all aware that plants uh, photosynthesize, so they take in carbon dioxide and water through the roots, and then with the use of sunlight and chlorophyll, they're able to convert the carbon dioxide and water into sugars and carbohydrates. And it's uh, a bit surprising, but up to 40% of the sugars, carbohydrates, and proteins that plants produce are released from their roots to attract and feed the microbes. Uh, that the plants require. We call those uh, uh, root exudates. So let's imagine what you could make with sugar, carbohydrate, and protein. So when you mix uh, sugar and a carbohydrate like flour and a protein like eggs and milk, uh, that's a recipe for cakes and cookies. So plants are putting out cakes and cookies to attract the microbes. And you can see in this picture here, I've got this lovely root system of a tree, and you can just imagine the wonderful cakes and cookies they're putting out to attract just the right kind of bacteria and fungi that are going to promote the growth of the plant. 
And they even uh, are, the plant is even able to control the pH of the soil locally along the root uh, by attracting different uh, bacteria and fungi. And it's the biotic glues that these uh, creatures release that, if, if you like, controls the, the pH of the soil. Another thing that they do is they release these exudates through their foliage as well. So uh, in healthy soil conditions, leaf surfaces are completely covered by the microbes held to the plant by the strong biotic glues. That protective layer is one of nature's way, ways of achieving disease suppression. So the next time you eat an organic lettuce leaf, assuming that it was grown in healthy soil, you have to imagine that you're actually not seeing the surface of that lettuce, but you're seeing the biotic glues on the surface. And they're so strongly held that you can't actually wash them off. And so when you eat that, you are ingesting uh, not only the lettuce, but the biotic glues and the bacteria and fungi and some of their predators. And that becomes part of your microbiome. So let's now look at another very important uh, job that the bacteria and fungi do for us. Uh, they create soil structure. So using biotic glues, which the bacteria secrete, they stick together soil, mineral, and organic matter in what are called microaggregates. So I've got a cartoon here of one of those microaggregates circled in red, which I can perhaps uh, highlight here with my arrow. Can you see that arrow? Okay, so we can see the arrow. Thanks. All right. The, the brown particles here are mineral particles, and the green are organic particles, and the blue is the trapped water. So these microaggregates can trap a great deal of water and purify that water. Uh, but as I say, these are microaggregates, so they're not really visible to the eye. Uh, and we can kind of think of them, though, as little bricks. Now what happens next is the fungal strands come along and they tie these bricks together to form buildings, uh, buildings that they like to live in anyway, which have doors and windows in them that allow air and water to penetrate to great depths into the soil. Because plant roots can only penetrate as far as the air is able to penetrate. So together they're building underground cities for the microbes to live in. Let's look at another aspect of uh, what's happening in healthy soil. So the panel above depicts the root systems of two identical plants. The one on the left is planted in dirt. The one on the right is planted in soil with a healthy food web, giving rise to a mycorrhizal fungal network. The network greatly extends the root area for extracting nutrients and water. So which of these plants is going to be less sensitive to drought? I think you can guess the one with the mycorrhizal fungal network. Through the work of researchers like Professor Suzanne Simard of the University of British Columbia, we now know that fungal networks can link plants together in a wood-wide web, allowing them to exchange signals as well as nutrients. So many of these plants are actually cooperating with one another. The idea that you have to have a monoculture to prevent competition is completely outdated. Well, let's now look at current agricultural practices. Plowing or tillage, growing of monocultures in the belief that diversity means competition, application of chemical fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides, livestock in confinement from poultry battery cages to feedlots, so for a moment, I'm going to focus on the first of these item, items, plowing or tillage. Here are two examples of plowing. And plowing slices and dices the soil structure built by the bacteria and fungi with their biotic glues, turning living soil to dirt. Those underground cities were home to a diverse ecosystem capable of providing all the nutrients plants required without the need for chemical fertilizers. About 20 years ago, it was discovered that plowing releases additional soil carbon into the atmosphere as climate warming 
uh, carbon dioxide. And here's a scientific study that was done in 1998 that illustrates uh, the findings. I'm going to first of all show you the equipment they used, and then we'll go and look at the data. So they used a piece of equipment called Mr. Jim, which stands for a mobile research gas exchange machine. And you can see it looks like a big box that they can park over uh, a part of the field that they've plowed or not plowed, and then they can extract the gas that's given off uh, and accumulate the gas that's given off during over a period of time. And typically they might observe for 24 hours. And then they compare the amount of carbon dioxide gas, for example, that's liberated by biological activity after plowing compared to say the biological activity uh, where in a portion of the field that they didn't plow. So now let's go back to the results. So on the left, you see uh, soil surface not tilled. So they parked the uh, Mr. Jam over that, and they've measured in the course of a 24 hour period, 11 grams of carbon dioxide emitted from each square meter. And then if you look to the right, you can see how that number varies depending on the depth to which the soil was plowed, going from four inches up to 11 inches. And by the time we get to 11 inches, which is not a uh, you know, particularly deep uh, level to plow, uh, we're seeing 15 times as much carbon dioxide liberated from that soil within a 24-hour period following the plowing. Well, carbon dioxide is a colorless and odorless gas, so we can't see that happening. And so it came as a really big surprise the extra amount of CO2, which is a greenhouse gas, that was being given off when a farmer plowed the field. So when the uh, interval of time was extended, not from not 24 hours, but when they went to 21 days, they found that even over that interval of time, if they accumulated all the gas that was liberated, it was now 10 times higher than the amount of gas that was given off by the same area of untilled soil. Well, the next thing I would like to do, uh, if we had the video usage, it would show you two soil lessons in a minute that were being done by Ray Archuleto, and they're very effective uh, teaching tools. The first one is the water infiltration test, and it shows how healthy soil can infiltrate and capture much more of the rainfall and store it in the soil. This alleviates drought and prevents soil erosion. So um, I think instead of going through these, let me give you a simple analogy um, um, to what healthy soil is able to do. Uh, and this is uh, an analogy due to uh, Dee Dee Pursehouse, um, who's uh, an, an advocate in this area of regenerative agriculture. And she says, look, uh, imagine you were to take uh, um, some baking flour and pile it up on a plate. And now take a paper cup and put some holes in the bottom and fill it with water and simulate rain onto this. Uh, so what you might expect to see is the water will run down the slope of that uh, uh, flour and take with it uh, the surface layer. So it's eroding away the surface layer of soil. But just uh, a, a very small distance down into that pile, if you scrape the surface away, you'll find it's completely dry. This is because the small flower particles sort of fill the voids uh, created by the bigger flower particles and seals the surface. So you can think of that as a heavily tilled soil. Um, now, uh, supposing we take the flour and we add some biology, we add some um, yeast, and the yeast is a fungus, and then we make flour, we make a, a loaf of bread out of that, and you now take a slice of bread and you put it down on the plate. Well, a slice of bread, you know, is all kind is is very spongy, but it's 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 basically flour held together by the biology by the fungus fungi. And uh, now if you take the same paper cup and you 
sprinkle water onto that flour, uh, sorry, onto the bread, you'll see now that it's, uh, it's the, the bread is completely absorbing it, right? It's acting like a sponge. And so the same thing happens to soil. Uh, if the soil is being badly disturbed and plowed, then the water can't in, inf infiltrate, it just runs off. Whereas uh, if you have undisturbed soil, and this is what the um, demonstration shows, is uh, the water uh, can actually percolate through uh, because uh, of the uh, channels that are created in the soil structure. So you're infiltrating and capturing the rainwater. Uh, the other thing that happens, of course, um, and, and the other video is on the soil stability test. That's a comparison of healthy soil with lots of microbes creating biotic glues and fungal strands that hold the soil together. So those, those glues literally uh, keep that soil intact. And so when it rains, water infiltrates, it doesn't run off and take the soil away and dump it into the stream and dump all your nutrients into the stream. So that's the other lesson. And, and those uh, videos uh, illustrate those really nicely. So without the biotic glues and the living plant roots, soil is easily washed away by rain or blown away during periods of drought, creating massive dust storms. And back in the 1930s, the uh, North American interior suffered a decade of drought. And uh, here's a picture uh, taken uh, in Stratford, Texas in 1935, showing this huge dust storm uh, approaching the community. Uh, and of course, that's just topsoil that has lost all of its biotic glues. Imagine what it'd be like waking up the next day and finding your house was largely buried in soil. How many times would you be willing to dig it out? But back in the 1930s, we had no idea how plowing upset the work of soil biology. Well, this is a dust storm, a more recent one that occurred in uh, 2011. So it's clear that most farmers still haven't heard, heard about this and, and really are not aware of uh, the soil biology revolution. So to save, to stop erosion, save carbon, we need to park the plow. Well, let's turn to some of the rest of agriculture. Much of, much of current agriculture is about killing. Weeds, fungi, insects, biodiversity, and even the farmer's profit. In nature, there are 1,700 beneficial or indifferent insect species for every one pest species. We're focusing on killing that one pest, but meanwhile, we're killing everything else. And I'm sure that your audience is looking at that, and when they see other species, they're talking about bees, right? According to entomologist Dr. Jonathan Lundgren, the cause is our current monoculture model of production. We try to keep monoculture production and the factory farming of livestock viable through chemistry, drugs, machinery, genetic engineering, and ultimately cash subsidy. This is a quote by Alan Savory, who's the author of Holistic Management. The other thing to keep in mind is that current agricultural model uses 10 calories of fossil fuel energy to produce one calorie of food. And since we have to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels, this uh, together with these other arguments I presented uh, imply that uh, current agricultural model is completely unsustainable. For too long, we have relied on technology to carry out chemical warfare against the microbes, weeds, insects, and nature, only to discover we are killing ourselves. So technology is a double-edged sword. Antibiotics, for example, gave us this tremendous decline of infectious diseases, which we all celebrated, saved many lives. Back then, we didn't know about our gut microbiome. We didn't know that our health is dependent on three pounds of microbes living in our gut that these microbes outnumber the cells in our body by 10 times. We depend on these microbes to help di digest our food, produce certain vitamins, make neurotransmitters for our brain, 
and regulate our immune system. Now we know that our antibiotics are destroying these microbes. So look also what uh, antibiotics have given us. The rise of chronic diseases. How many people have asthma, uh, diabetes, um, obesity, uh, autism, even neurological diseases are uh, attributed now to many of the, uh, to, to the gut microbes not functioning and producing the neurotransmitters that they used to do. It turns out that the largest use of antibiotics is in agriculture. The most widely used uh, is glyphosate, the active ingredient in many herbicides like Roundup, but is also a patented broad spectrum antibiotic. In the US, 30 39 times more glyphosate is used than all antibiotics in medicine. This is a pretty sobering thing when I first uh, came across it. One of the uh, people whose uh, YouTubes are very fascinating to watch is uh, a triple board certified doctor, US doctor, Zach Bush. And uh, here I just uh, uh, summarize some of the uh, points that he was making about the new first world epidemic. This is data taken from the United States. Uh, and this is concerning uh, nine of the more common uh, chronic diseases. So the first here is autism, which currently is running at one in 36. In 1975, one in 5,000 children had autism. By 2010, this was up to one in 100. And by 2035, the predictions are it will hit one in three children with autism. That's uh, mind blowing. Um, asthma is now one in 10. Attention deficit disorder is one in eight. Allergy, one in four. Diabetes, one in four. Obesity, one in three. Major depression, one in two. Cancer, one in two. This is expected to reach 70% by 2035 and does not include skin cancer. And infertility. Currently in the US, it's one in four females are infertile and one in three men are infertile. In 1965, only 4% of the US population had a chronic disease. Today, according to Dr. Bush, 46% of the children have chronic disease. We clearly have to change the way we do agriculture. If we use our new knowledge of soil biology, we can farm in ways that don't require these chemicals that are killing us. Here's an alternative agricultural model, biomimicry or nature's way. Nature doesn't plow or till the soil. A certain amount of disturbance by animals is natural as plants and animals co-evolve together. Nature favors biodiversity. A typical natural prairie grassland has over a hundred different plants living together in a mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship. Nature is soil, uh, natural soil is full of living microbes. They provide all the nutrients plants need, protect, protect against disease and increase soil carbon. Adding fertilizers upsets this ecology. Nature has plants covering the ground year round and nature's way is sustainable and more profitable for the farmer. So we need to move to what we call regenerative agriculture, where we rebuild the soil biology and sequester more carbon at the same time as we grow food. Since most agricultural soils have been degraded, this is not a situation we want to sustain. So we need to move beyond sustainability to regenerative agriculture. Now, some of you will uh, be asking uh, by this time, well, how exactly do we do this? And unfortunately, I don't have a three hour presentation. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop after uh, at least an hour. And uh, I just wanted to sh throw up a couple of useful examples that you could dig into and find out how you might go about this. 
Here's an illustration of just how important soil carbon is uh, to the health of our soil. So on this uh, graph, on the bottom axis, we have soil carbon percent ranging on the left-hand side from 0% up to about 6% on the right-hand side. Now in native soils, that's before we started plowing and doing industrial agriculture, the, the, the typical carbon content level was around between four and 5%. And on the vertical axis now, you see the soil water holding capacity of the, in the top 12 inches of that soil in gallons per acre. So back uh, when we were dealing with native soils, those native soils could hold about 100,000 gallons per acre. Now, uh, the, the effect of our current conventional agriculture has been to drive the percent carbon from four or five percent down to one percent and less in many cases. So most agricultural soil is down at around the one percent level or less which means that we are currently only able to hold 40,000 gallons per acre. That's a huge difference between, um, there's a huge difference between 100,000 and 40,000. But if we increase as we can uh, with soil biology, uh, even a 1% increase translates to an additional 25,000 gallons per acre of water storage. This allows you to grow plants for a longer period of time, to be much more drought resistance, resistant. So how do we rebuild the soil biology? By inoculating the dirt with a thin layer of compost or by spraying with a compost extract or compost tea made from the compost. It's important to ensure the compost is teeming with a good selection of soil microbes using a soil microscope. We also have to ensure there's a good cover of plants providing the root exudates to feed the microbes. These carbon compounds, that are the root exudates, they're like the batteries that the microbes run on. Without those batteries, they can't recycle and they're not, um, uh, they're, they're not carrying out their mining operations. Uh, and the only way they can get that carbon if the plants don't provide it, is they have to cannibalize any stored carbon in the soil. And that makes the soil even less fertile. Of course, we have to stop plowing and stop using synthetic fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides uh, because that, of course, will just uh, mean that we will have to continuously uh, replenish those microbes uh, and it's going to be a rather losing proposition. But if we don't kill them off um, and we keep plenty of plants there to provide the uh, root exudates, then we think of it as inoculation. You do it once or twice and that's it. As long as you don't kill them off again, uh, the soil will begin to get healthier and healthier. All right, now I want to, in the final part of my talk, turn to livestock grazing. According to the United Nations Agricultural Organization, 62% of agricultural land is used for grazing. The areas in brown are dryland regions that are the current and former grasslands of the world, which are turning or have turned to desert. Desertification is a huge problem. Conventional wisdom has it that one of the main causes of desertification is overgrazing by herbivores like cattle, sheep, and goats. This is especially true in drought prone regions. According to the African biologist Alan Savory, we were once just as certain the earth was flat. He has shown it is not about the numbers of animals, it's all about timing. It's our failure to manage plant recovery time that leads to overgrazing and land desertification. So how does that work? Well, what's typically practiced uh, in the early stages of the life of a calf is they'll spend the first six months of the year with their mother uh, continuously grazing in a, con uh, in a pasture. So they'll have unrestricted access throughout the grazing season. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a native grassland has over 100 different plant species, 100 different types of grasses and plants. And herbivores, like uh, humans, have their favorites. 
And uh, among their favorites, they prefer the freshest growth. So they'll go along and eat their favorites until they're all gone before they start uh, looking around at the other stuff to eat. But as soon as they see uh, their favorite uh, in, in, as a baby grass starting to grow again, they'll be right back cropping it again. And they'll do that again and again until finally the plant roots die because the plant roots have to be recharged by the photosynthesis process. So you've got to allow the plant to regrow to produce all those sugars and carbohydrates and proteins and send some of them down to the roots to restore and rebuild the roots. But with continuous grazing, uh, basically you're um, uh, killing off uh, the plants, the plant roots, and that will lead to bare ground. And this is particularly true in parts of the world, um, many of those that showed up on the satellite image that were very drought prone. So they maybe have a couple of months of rain and then 10 months of drought. And uh, so as you can imagine, uh, those microbes that are lingering in the soil, they're just gonna cannibalize whatever is left in the way of soil carbon. And uh, the soil is gonna get very hot because it's bare, dark and bare, and all the water moisture that's in there will all evaporate away. And so we're well on the way to desertification. So how does nature solve this problem? Here's an aerial view of a herd of wildebeest. And notice how those wildebeest are all bunched together. They're bunched together because of the ferocious predators. They're only safe inside the herd. So the herd has to keep moving to avoid eating their own waste even. So, don't, so they don't get to eat grass as it regrows. By the time the herd returns from their migration, the grass is fully grown and is ready and needs to be eaten. So timing is the key. So how can humans imitate nature? Well, Alan Savory has been teaching us how to do that. One method is to use electric fences to emulate the predators. So imagine we went back to that uh, big pasture that the cattle were con continuously grazing in. And now we imagine that we divide that pasture into maybe 30 to 60 paddocks, where each paddock is just uh, temporary and it's, uh, it's set up by this electric fence, this portable electric fence. And so we take all the animals and put them within that paddock. And now they get to eat in fairly high concentration, uh, but only for a very short period of time. So they only get to eat the grass once before we move them on to the next paddock. Now in this particular uh, photograph, the cattle are all bunched together at one end of the paddock uh, because they're being moved now. The, the gate has been opened and they're now able to go into the next paddock. Um, but you can see in the back of that paddock, there's some space there. So they're not normally quite as concentrated that when they're actually grazing. Here's the Saskatchewan rancher, Neil Dennis, uh, spending about 20 minutes each day setting up the electric fence for the next paddock. So the previous slide showed uh, one of the paddocks where he had his uh, tre tremendous herd of cattle. So you can imagine that if you've got 60 paddocks, then it means you don't come back to the current paddock for another 60 days, which is plenty of time to allow the grass to fully regrow. Now, if the grass grows faster, you could get away with maybe 30 paddocks or depending on how many days you need uh, to get the grass to regrow. Here's an alternate method that's frequently used by Alan Savory in Africa, which uses herder, herders and provides employment where work is scarce. And what Savory has noticed that he can get an increase of up to 400% in the number of cattle the land will support. So basically what he's saying is if you are optimizing the plant recovery, uh, you're able to grow a lot more grass uh, than if you uh, are constantly continuously grazing. Uh, because when the grass is small, it grows slowly. It's only when it gets to the teenage phase that it grows rapidly. And so if you're continuously grazing, you're keeping it at the baby phase all the time, and it's just very slowly growing. You don't produce anywhere near as much forage. 
Here's uh, uh, some more results um, uh, for managing for plant recovery time and how it can increase plant biomass. This was an experiment that was conducted for 10 years uh, in Oklahoma. And you can see in the graph, you're going from 1998 to 1997 uh, at the end here. And on the vertical axis, we have the amount of forage produced in animal unit days. So an animal unit day is the amount of forage required for one animal unit for one day. And an animal unit is typically a cow-calf pair. You can see that after 10 years, they're approaching a 400% increase in the amount of forage and hence the amount of cattle that they can uh, support. Now, some people would say, well, we don't need more animals. Um, uh, so is, is, is this a good thing or a bad thing? But keep in mind uh, that th th these are animals that are fed on, the, on grass, which is their natural uh, forage material as opposed to being in a feedlot and being fed grains, which uh, people have cut down forests in order to grow those grains. So uh, I'd much sooner have them eating their natural uh, food, uh, producing a healthy animal, and saving us from having to cut down all these forests. This just shows some of the uh, training hubs around the world where savories uh, the Savory Institute uh, are teaching farmers um, how to uh, graze in this fashion. But wait a minute, aren't we supposed to eat less meat? Methane is a significant greenhouse gas and uh, ruminants are reportedly producing a lot of methane. But we have been ignoring a whole other side to the story. When herbivores are adaptively grazed to emulate nature, there is actually a net reduction in greenhouse gas. The greenhouse gas emission of methane is more than compensated for by the amount of atmospheric carbon sequestered in the soil. And here's some of the recent science uh, dating as recently as, as 2018. So it turns out that grass-fed cattle, sheep, and goats can be a big part of the solution if we manage plant recovery time. So let's have a look at the evidence that regenerative agriculture leads to carbon sequestration. This is a graph from a, a recent paper, uh, which is, uh, illustrates the best working hypothesis for North America's net agricultural greenhouse gas emissions for a transition to regenerative cropping and regenerative grazing practices. So, uh, on the left, you see plotted the net greenhouse gas emission in gigatons of carbon per year. And this is for North America. And by North America, that means the US uh, in, in this publication. Um, and, on the, and, and you can see that uh, if I move my arrow here, you can see above this line here, the numbers are all positive. So this means that uh, if we're in that region, we're uh, taking carbon in the soil and putting it up in the atmosphere. So we're, we're producing greenhouse gas. In the region of the graph where it's negative, we're actually sequestering carbon. We're pulling it out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis and storing it in the ground. That's a good thing. And What's shown here are five different uh, agricultural practices. So the first is current agricultural practice, which is known to contribute 28% to the global greenhouse gas emissions. Often the number quoted is somewhat lower than that, but that's because they ignore um, the farm soil, the greenhouse gases due to farm soil erosion. So uh, you can see that the bar here is color coded uh, green stands for the greenhouse gas emissions from livestock. Uh, red is from farm soil erosion. And blue is from regular uh, uh, growing of crops using fertilizers. So in the second case, uh, this just illustrates what happens if we reduce the number of ruminants by 50%. And basically what you see is we make a small, we decrease the amount of greenhouse gas emissions by a small amount. 
But if we were to jump to 100% regenerative cropping and uh, AMP grazing, now AMP grazing stands for adaptive multi-paddock grazing, which is what I was showing you just a bit earlier. That's a, a regenerative grazing practice. So that's what I mean by regenerative grazing. So if we were to transform the way we do agriculture to 100% regenerative cropping and uh, regenerative grazing, we would be uh, sequestering a huge amount of carbon. Uh, that corresponds to basically 120% of the net greenhouse gas emission that currently North America emits would be stored in the ground. That's phenomenal. We would be going from plus 28% to minus 120%. It, by the way, it just is an accident. These are gigatons of carbon, and by accident, 28% uh, happens to be on this diagram 0.28, and 120% uh, on this corresponds to 1.2, but that, that's just by accident. Um, anyway, I think you can see how, um, uh, uh, according to the best working hypothesis currently, uh, we could uh, make a very significant change in the amount of greenhouse gas that we're putting up. Uh, and if we were to do this on all of agricultural land uh, on the planet, uh, we'd very likely um, um, uh, sequester more carbon each year than we are actually emitting. And notice also that how big a role the uh, cattle, sheep, and goats play, the herbivores play. That's this big green portion of the bar. So uh, they're gonna be very important to our helping to solve global warming. And so here's what we might achieve if we did 25%, if, if only 25% of the world uh, were converted to regenerative cropping and grazing, and then 50%. I think at the 50% level, uh, we're basically able to sequester three quarters of all of the carbon uh, that we're currently putting up. So I hope I persuaded you it's not the cow, it's how we're managing the cows. It's the how. So I would, as an astronomer, of course, I'd like to have five planets uh, that I could do, you know, the five different forms of uh, grazing and cropping on, but that's uh, a fantasy. We're never going to have that situation. So uh, we're really going to have to, um, you know, start acting pretty quickly and doing much larger experiments of the regenerative grazing and cropping to validate the, uh, the working hypothesis that we currently have. And there is quite a bit of potential for improved data because over the next four years, we may acquire a lot more data as the French government has embarked on a regenerative agricultural program in its sequestering large amounts of atmospheric carbon with improved soil monitoring. This is their uh, four per 1,000 initiative that they proposed back in 2015 at COP21. Now, many of us didn't even hear about this, um, but there was a big banner on the, um, the Eiffel Tower uh, describing uh, their intention. And uh, you remember that uh, back in 2015, all the world's uh, leaders met in Paris and they agreed to certain uh, voluntary amounts uh, by which they would uh, cut back on their emissions. And uh, of course, the French government uh, had received these commitments ahead of the actual meeting. And so uh, they uh, asked their uh, soil scientists to uh, come up with a plan because they were afraid that those commitments would not get us to uh, under two degrees of warming. And, and so they came up with this four per 1,000 initiative uh, to show how basically agriculture could make up the difference. Uh, and I won't dwell on it much longer, but um, uh, this is an initiative that's going on. Uh, Canada is not participating in it, the US or Russia have signed up, including uh, Australia and uh, Austria. Well, here's, here's the list. This was the list in 2016. 
hopefully more countries will join this important initiative. Well, I did have a final video, uh, which uh, nicely summarizes all of the points that I've made in about three and a half minutes. Uh, so I do hope that you'll, you'll have a look at that. Uh, it puts uh, all these issues into a really good perspective. And um, let's just close with a picture of uh, the Earth as seen from uh, the moon. So drifting together through space on our small blue lifeboat called Earth, guided by our new understanding of soil biology and nature's complexity, we urgently need to pull together to survive and prosper. So let's get started rebuilding soil biology and putting uh, carbon back into the soil. So that's basically my message. Um, I have just a few more slides of supplementary material to share. Uh, so if you want to follow up, um, these will lead you to uh, that. Uh, would you like me to just uh, quickly go over those? Uh, yes, please. Okay. So, of course, there's my resource, uh, the 39-minute uh, video on the magic of soil, and there's the link, and then there's a whole bunch of other um, videos and talks that I have published, uh, and those can all be found on my university website. And included in that is uh, um, a link to supplementary material on my lecture. Uh, how are seeds planted in no-till farming? Gabe Brown's story, a farmer ahead of his time, and all kinds of practical examples um, that uh, many of your readers might uh, be curious about. Um, some of the uh, talks by Elaine Ingham uh, and, and many good books. Um, and here, of course, is Dr. David Johnson. Uh, I understand, Shelley, that you were witness to him talking in Montreal very recently. And he's got some really interesting videos. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a very nice TED talk about some work um, in Canada and, and a market garden, eating our way out of this mess. Um, and then a host of other uh, videos, uh, some of them by Alan Savory, and information about the Savory Institute. So uh, I, I try to keep that updated and uh, substitute in more recent and more relevant stuff as it comes along. Um, and then we can address the question of what can you do to help? Well, many of you, of course, are helping tremendously with the pollinator side of the issue, and that's a really important role. Um, but uh, for gardeners and farmers, well, you can check out the supplementary material. Uh, you can try it out on a portion of your garden or farm to start with. And just keep in mind that soils uh, be become customized to synthetic fer fertilizers and they're like addicts. So you need to wean them off gradually. So if you go cold turkey on your complete garden, you might have a couple of years where you're not really producing anything. So I'd suggest, you know, you, you break into it gradually. If you're a farmer, you know, take a few acres and learn what you need to know and see how it works. Uh, because it's a very different way of, of doing agriculture. Uh, learn how to add soil biology back with compost and compost extract. Um, now there are, and you, you also could consult on a good source of soil with active biology. Uh, Elaine Ingham has trained uh, a great number of soil food web consultants. And you may find that there's one in your area. I mean, uh, Montreal has got uh, a very uh, renowned uh, uh, soil food web consultant who uh, organized this uh, meeting that you're at, Shelley. And we have uh, several in BC, in the Vancouver area. And uh, they will be able to tell you, for example, where to buy soil uh, that's rich in biology, right? Uh, it's not just dirt. Um, and they'll also be able to test your soil if you want to find out, well, what's the biology like in this compost that I want to put on? Well, if you're an urbanite, um, you want to help increase the awareness of soil biology and its role in food security and on, you know, the issues of uh, uh, our health. Um, 
after all, it's, it's, you know, only a few percent of the population in Canada are involved at all in food production and, and, and agriculture. And, uh, and mo most of the decisions, though, about the course of the future are made by urbanites, because that's uh, where all the politicians and the lawyers live. And uh, so it's up to us to become more aware of these things so that we can vote intelligently, for one thing. If you have a personal connection with an organization that would appreciate my message, well, please connect us. Use your purchasing power to support organic agriculture and grass-fed meat production. Join a, a, commu a community-supported agricultural program, a CSA, um, where you're uh, helping a farmer to provide the very best food um, that you will enjoy for the season. Start a garden or volunteer at a community garden and become a supporter of the SAVE Institute. It's my opinion that that is perhaps the, the most effective organization currently mm -hmm. that's operating on a large enough scale that it could make a difference, that it, des it deserves our support. Uh, we need to see that become mainstream. Uh, and um, even if you, uh, you know, uh, a vegan, you know, you have a vegan diet and you believe in veganism, um, it turns out that we're going to have to rely on herbivores uh, to save our bacon, so to speak. Um, and uh, um, I, I hope maybe I persuaded you that, that all of nature's creatures have an important role in our biosphere. Everything from the microbes to the largest herbivores, they have a purpose. Now, some of these purposes we have are only beginning to understand. Um, and to think that we know it all and that we can make a decision, oh, we don't need cows, we don't need this, we don't need that. What we need is technology. Well, that's a very myopic viewpoint, and I would discourage that. Um, finally, uh, Become more informed about how your food is produced and how strongly agriculture, agricultural practices affect our health and future. So with that, I will close. Oh. Well, thank you so much. That was just a fantastic presentation. Um, you know, it, it's like Christmas morning and opening all these gifts uh, of what you're sharing um, with, with all of us that, um, that the news is good <laughs> uh, of what we can do. Um, so I, I'd like to open it up to uh, everybody who's here participating with us. Um, if you have comments or um, questions, we have quite the, the expert here. It's um, anybody would if you want to to type something in. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll start by asking a question. So, you know, uh, so with Bee City, we've got, you know, 24 cities. So what would you say would, would be some messages that we could convey to, to our cities? Um, you know, our mayors and city councillors, because they, they may not know anything about this. I'm, I'm assuming they may not know very much at all about, about agriculture. Yeah, my, my experience is that uh, many farmers don't know much about this either too, right? Um, so it's not surprising that uh, city councillors uh, are fairly uh, ill-informed on these things. Um, so as to, uh, uh, well, first of all, I think um, the idea that uh, soil biology is critically important to um, surviving climate change and to um, you know, having food security, and in uh, just uh, for human health. Um, that's a, a really important message, but I guess first of all, people have to be aware that um, of just how badly done uh, the soil has been by the way we're doing agriculture currently. But you know, in BC right now, we're very concerned about forest fires. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, why do we have all these forest fires? Well, partly it's due to the fact that we're growing monoculture tree crops. Um, 
Uh, and in some cases, we're actually spraying the forest with glyphosate, which of course is killing uh, the microbes. Um, and uh, well, if you kill off the, uh, the, the fungi, which are responsible really for decomposing a dead tree, it is just standing there waiting for a fire to come, right? Um, and the soil, because it's not got good healthy life in it, it's not absorbing water, it's not storing, it's not like a reservoir of water, keeping that uh, soil hydrated, which means that uh, you, know, you could be having uh, 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 a lot more uh, water evaporating, transpiring from the trees because it's being able to suck up the water from the soil. That, those trees, uh, they also, um, trans in addition to transpiring water, there's a lot of uh, microbes, uh, bacteria and fungi that get swept up into the atmosphere as well. And these become uh, nucleation sources for raindrops. So trees in a healthy uh, environment can actually produce the rain <laughs> that's needed to put the forest fire out. Uh, but this kind of thinking is currently very remote from, um, you know, the way things are done. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would say that another argument um, from my reading, I've found that when people uh, do this holistic grazing that I described to you, um, they find that um, uh, a lot of the native grasses start returning a lot of the plants that are pollinators start returning. All of a sudden, farmers are discovering, my gosh, there's about 20 different dung beetles. So the diversity of life that reemerges when you put biology back into control is phenomenal. And of course, you're not killing the pollinators. You're now creating the environment for them to flourish. So, Biology is uh, what the world has relied on until humans came along and thought they knew better. And uh, we're just now, you might say, at the end of humanity, beginning to realize what, how sophisticated and, and complex nature is. So we've got to celebrate all of biology, right? Uh, all of the creatures. And let's not uh, claim that anyone is bad. Uh, they're all needed. Yeah, thank you so much for that, those comments. Um, uh, that's the message, you know, uh, pollinators, insects, it's, it, the bees sort of lead us everywhere, and uh, um, which led us to talking about soil. Here's some questions. Uh, Lorraine uh, has one. She says, um, that was fascinating, your talk. Does replacing lawns with plants, shrubs, and trees increase carbon sequestering on home lots? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so uh, certainly uh, it turns, well, can I speak around that question? Um, um, uh, for, to start with, um, you know, if you, it, it turns out that uh, when you look into it, there's more herbicides used in, on home lawns and golf courses than are used in, in agriculture by and large, right? So uh, these chemicals, uh, we're the culprits. The urbanites are a big culprit, right? So if you were to have a lawn, that you didn't, you swore off using any dandelion killers. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, for years, you know, when I talk to people before I share with them the, the dangers of these chemicals, they say, oh, I used to use buckets of glyphosate. You know, it was, uh, I thought it was completely harmless, right? Um, so, you know, if you can get that biology working um, and growing your grass, uh, well, ideally, you wouldn't cut the grass so it's always short because then you're minimizing the amount of photosynthesis. You know, the, the carbon that's stored in the ground is the carbon that, is, uh, that comes through the roots, the root exudates, that the biology then stores in the ground, right? 
through their dead carcasses and through humates that they may make as well, or humus. Um, so if you want to make uh, lots of carbon and store it in the ground, you want to maximize your photosynthesis that's going on on your lawn. And that would mean that if you keep it at the baby phase by cutting it all the time, you're minimizing the, the photosynthesis. You're minimizing the potential to store carbon. Even if you just had a, your lawn grew up uh, and then when it was fully grown, you cut it down. Um, you would find probably that all kinds of uh, you know, native soil plants would start appearing, uh, including flowers and, and well, the weeds would appear initially, but they would soon get buried in, in the, the grasses. Um, so that would be one way of maximizing your photosynthesis, right? Now, as to whether or not replacing them all with shrubs um, and small trees, um, I would think that uh, it would be, um, as opposed to having a, a, you know, a garden where the, the grass grew up before you cut it down, uh, it would be, uh, you know, difficult to decide which would be the better, um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, right? Um, now, it may be that, you know, you have a problem, you have to educate your neighbors, too, that, um, you know, they don't want to see this tall grass, it's, it's looking unsightly, we, we really need to educate ourselves, um, but maybe some of those grasses could be crops, um, they could be rye, you could harvest. Uh, they could be, um, you know, just become a, a food uh, source, right? And of course, if you want to add nut trees and uh, you could create your own food forest in your garden too. Uh, and then you would be providing nutritious food at the same time as you were sequestering carbon. So there's lots of different options. Um, and I think, you know, uh, one has to work uh, in together with your community to bring the community along as you make these radical changes, right? Yes, um, thank you. Um, Susan Blaney has a comment. She says, thank you very much this is for the presentation. She says, I live in an agricultural area and have found the farmers to be very skeptical, skeptical about giving up pesticides. She says, I'll try to get this message out. Yeah, I, I could say a, a comment. I've, I've been having a conversation with a Saskatchewan farmer uh, for a number of years. Um, and what drew me to him was uh, he was the, uh, he was the chairman of um, the local conservation society for, for the farms. And, and, and they were forced to go to no-till farming because they were all going bankrupt. Um, they weren't getting enough water to grow a cash crop every year. So they only had one cash crop every other year. But when they went no-till, they managed to get a cash crop every year. And so um, I learned about this and I talked to them about it. And uh, I asked, well, why don't you go the next step and now you know, start putting biology, using compost, put the biology back and using the, the mining operations of the fungi to provide all those nutrients that your plants need. And he, he wasn't prepared to believe that. He, his argument was, and, and uh, it's widespread, um, it stands to reason that if I'm uh, growing grains and I'm exporting to Russia or other parts of the world, I'm exporting my nutrients. And so I've got to add those nutrients back. All right. It seems like a very logical argument. But that's because he's unaware of the soil biology. Because according to and other uh, practitioners, uh, as long as you've got rocks, sand, silt, and clay, you're never going to be short of nutrients if you have active biology working for you. And uh, in fact, they've been able to quantify how much extra nitrogen is arising from the active biology and it's more than enough to grow you know in any crop that they want to uh, so it's uh, it's a you know it's a belief system which i believe is a myth um, 
but it's a hard nut to crack to get beyond that. Um, I think the only way is you've got to see a demonstration, right, uh, of other farmers doing that. And of course, at the same time, saving all that money because the, um, the, the, the chemistry is very expensive. Uh, GMO seeds are very expensive. And this is the reason why many farmers are hamstrung. They can't change because if they go no-till, which they'd like to do in some cases, um, apart from Saskatchewan, they were desperate, they had to. In other parts of Canada, they don't do no-till by and large. And uh, if they wanted to, Oh, we the time so they're having to borrow money sorry Doctor. well the banker's not going to lend him the money for the seeds unless he's assured yeah so, sorry it just sorry. you you cut out there for just a, a minute or so just sorry oh, okay just, sorry i don't mean to <laughs> well i was going on and on uh, a bit too long on that question so why don't we uh if there's another question let's let's go to the other question uh, oh, well, Susan has a question. She says, do you know if this information is being taught in sustainable agriculture programs? Uh, I would like to say I wish uh, that it was, but um, uh, uh, my impression is that uh, it's still only the rare agricultural school that uh, where farmers are taught about soil biology. And um, uh, that's my impression. Um, I do have a look at quite a number of the papers that many agricultural scientists are publishing. And um, I have to say that the majority that I look at, if you go through the paper and you do a search on the word soil biology, it's not mentioned. It doesn't exist in their language, right? Uh, that they're using in the paper. Uh, root exudates, not mentioned. Um, so um, we've got a big mountain to move to, uh, to you know, it's, it's the fourth generation, you know, the third generation, well, the green revolution was you know, the use of chemistry to solve um, uh, agricultural problems. After we turn the soil to dirt by plowing, um, you had to add chemistry uh, unless you knew about soil biology in order to grow things. And now the emphasis is by and large on using clever satellite tricks and, and uh, drones and computer uh, technology in order to uh, make the application of chemicals more sophisticated, make the plowing more sophisticated. Um, and by and large, reduce the work for the farmer uh, in the sense that he can now manage a much bigger farm, um, but all within the context of you buy the GMO seeds, you buy the, uh, the chemicals, and the person that really makes the money is the, the chemical company, and the farmer uh, sits on the brink of bankruptcy, bankruptcy uh, most of his life. Yeah. Um, just wondering, have you uh, in BC, um, were you able to speak to the Minister of Agriculture there provincially or federally? <laughs> uh, I haven't achieved that. I've certainly been writing to the NDP and the Green Party, and um, I, I have a small audience, but it hasn't, uh, I, I, it hasn't really uh, caught on, right? Um, I think there's still um there's too many voices uh, 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 that are putting out the mythology uh, and the message of the chemical companies. Um, I came very close to talking to the Minister of the Environment when I was in uh, New Zealand recently. Mm -hmm. um, I gave two talks there, as I mentioned to you before I began this presentation and um, I did get a call from the minister's office and she wanted to have a telephone conversation, but and we set it up, but on the last minute she had to cancel because of another activity. So I did promise to send her some information and I, hopefully, um, you know, that, that might uh, uh, get noticed. 
but it, it, it often is the case that uh, the message that you give is more readily accepted in another country than your own home province or country, right? It's pretty sad. Unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, I, and I did learn at this Living Soil uh, conference that I attended um, that in Manitoba, there are regenerative farmers there and uh, they're bringing Alan Savory's, I think, uh, a course to Manitoba. Um, so if anyone's interested, mm -hmm. <laughs> I can try to connect you uh, to learn more. And uh, I did meet a regenerative farmer here in Ontario, and I know there were quite a few farmers at this symposium, and it was a very, very optimistic um, group of people. And um, there's certainly, uh, you know, as I said, the, the, the soil, it, it's right below our feet, all the answers, you know, and... Uh, um, and, and, you know, to study soil is really something incredible. It's magic, as you say, it's really quite magic um, what nature provides for us. We just have to listen and, and pay attention. Um, so just wondering if there's any comments or maybe how we can get the word out, if anybody has any ideas, maybe a marketing campaign, a GoFundMe or something. Um, maybe some creative ways that uh, we can share this, this message with people or with even students. You know, we have B schools, we have uh, 24 B schools across Canada. We just had our latest school in Whitehorse. <laughs> and uh, so we're making sure that the students know about this, that they know that there's answers. You know, they're very concerned about the environment, about their future. Um, and I mm -hmm. think it, important for all of us to share this with students to, sh to share them that the, the answers are there for us nature provides us with the answers and uh, you know with students once they know they make sure that their parents know it as well so I, I think they're a, a group that we should um, consider um, educating as soon as possible <laughs> I agree completely and and I think also you know um, as consumers we have a lot of power as well uh, I know that uh, uh, for many people, the idea of buying organic is, uh, oh, that's far too expensive, right? I can't afford that. Um, but uh, it's, uh, you know, it, if buying organic uh, could save your daughter or son from uh, asthma, autism, and other chronic diseases like Crohn's, um, are you uh, you may well have to, you know, nowadays most uh, families are uh, two breadwinners in the family. And uh, if your children now become very sick, uh, then you've lost a breadwinner. And uh, if you could have avoided that by paying up front uh, for organic, that would be so powerful uh, because, uh, you know, it's been estimated that if we can get or grow organic uh, purchases up to 5%, um, that will be a tipping point and it will drive people away from uh, the uh, GMO uh, chemical producers, right? So uh, I, I do want to emphasize, we all have that, uh, that uh, consumer power uh, and, um, uh, if you can't afford it, you might try growing some of your own too, right? Uh, it's, it's a tricky problem, but it's another very powerful way uh, because food distributors are very conscious of, uh, you know, small changes in, in consumer practices. Uh, and they're constantly trying to look ahead to, you know, producers that are going to provide what, what is required. Yes, um, thank you. So, um, Susan... Oh no, so it's Julianne, uh, Julianne from Ottawa. She says, oh, wonderful talk. I think master gardeners can also help to educate gardeners through their talks and writing. Uh, I know uh, Lorraine is also a master gardener, but she calls herself more a, um, not a gardener, but a guardian, <laughs> a guardian of the, of okay. uh, her garden. Um, let's see, Susan Blaney says, so much food for thought, must have some time to digest. Thank you for all your hard work in gathering this knowledge. Yeah, th this was quite, quite incredible. I mean, I've learned bits and pieces of over the last maybe four years now, but 
it's just everything is there and you've got the best people there um, that all of us can can learn so much from and share so is there any uh, any any last would you like I'd like to leave the last comments to you uh, dr. Gregory I'm just gonna get this mm -hmm. So yeah, would you like to leave us maybe with the last message? Sorry about my phone. <laughs> well, I, I think that uh, uh, my wife and I operate on the principle that uh, we just have to do. You know, we have to to um, uh, uh, basically uh, use this knowledge that we've acquired, keep expanding it because there's always new information that comes along. Uh, but, uh, you know, do this in our gardens, do this uh, in our sharing. And I have to say that uh, your group, uh, B Cities Canada, uh, are right in there batting with the rest of us. Um, and we're going to make a difference. Great. Thank you. Those are great last words. So thank you again. Um, for this incredible presentation and we'll make sure that it gets shared with as many people as possible and everyone listening i encourage you to share this with as many people as possible and maybe we'll continue this conversation about what we can all do to make this different okay thank okay. you so much thank you. have a good afternoon everyone <laughs>